Well, thanks for joining me again today for this week's lesson from the Word of God. We're studying the Bible together, and uh, last week we started a brand new message series. We will continue it today with part two, fake part two, discerning between the real and the fake. We want to differentiate between what is real and what is unreal, between what is false and what is true. And last week, we talked about wisdom. There's real wisdom, and then there's fake wisdom. In James chapter 3, it talks about that very clearly, and also some other passages in the Bible that show us how fake wisdom is totally different. The worldly wisdom is totally different from the wisdom of God. True wisdom, godly wisdom, begins with the fear of the Lord. And worldly wisdom is very egotistical, very selfish. It looks out for number one. It looks out for oneself. There's a lot of envy and a lot of, you know, uh, wrong motivation and manipulation and all those kinds of things. So there's a big difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. And our subject today is goodness. We're going to talk about real goodness and fake goodness. And the title of my message is, Do You Really Believe That You Are Good? Or How Good Do You Think You Really Are? Are. Now, we could call this also righteousness. There's a lot of fake righteousness. The Bible actually calls it self-righteousness. There's a lot of self-righteous people out there that are good in their own eyes, that think that they're really good and special. And the Bible says we should not be that way. We should have a different kind of righteousness, a godly righteousness. The same way we should seek godly wisdom is the way we should have a godly, heavenly righteousness. And what that looks like, we will see today. But how good do you think you are? Do you think you are good? Seriously, do you think you're good? Well, that's what we'll answer today. Let's go to our first two verses in the Gospel of Mark. We'll read more than two verses, but we'll start with these two verses. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17, it says this. As Jesus started on his way, Jesus was always on the go. He was always speaking and preaching and healing and delivering and helping people. A man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Now, reverence uh, is always falling on your knees. That's very important. He fell on his knees before him and said, Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. Very interesting the way this story starts. And there are two very central statements. Number one, what must, what must I do? Now, that's a question people all over the world at all times have always asked themselves, what must I do? No matter what religion, even atheists and agnostics, Buddhists, Muslims, and even Christians, what must I do. And the second very important statement is, good, it comes from Jesus, good is only one. No one is good except God alone. So the man asks, the young man asks, what must I do? That's the all uh, ever-present question of humanity. What must I do to be right with God? What must I do to be enough? What must I do? And Jesus' answer is incredible. No one is good except God alone. Now, some have taken this passage and said, well, that proves that Jesus uh, did not claim to be God, you know, because he says no one is good except God alone. But I'm telling you, exactly the contrary is true. Jesus is making a point here. 
Do you really know who you're talking to? Do you know what it means to be good and th that, that there's only one who is really good? That's God. And he actually confirms here, if you read it correctly and study what he's really saying here correctly, you come to the conclusion that Jesus knows and claims to be God. And he just tells this guy or asks this guy, do you even know who you are talking to? We know from Scripture, from the Gospels and other passages, that Jesus is God and that Jesus actually claimed to be God himself. So that's a problem for humanity because it's all about achievement. I have to earn my way. I have to earn my salvation. I have to earn my good points with God or the universe or karma or whatever you want to call it. People out there, whether they're Christians or not, they always ask, what must I do? And the belief in oneself and one's own goodness is also a big problem in the world we are living today. Now, I live in Austria, which is a small country in Europe, in case you don't know. Not Australia, no kangaroos here, uh, except in the zoo. But in Austria, it is said the most self-righteous people make their home here in Austria. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm telling you, as long as I can remember, as long as I'm a preacher, uh, a proclaimer of the gospel, I've certainly seen a lot of self-righteous people. And when I look at my own church, I notice who comes to my church or when visitors come or new people come. Well, it's usually those who have problems, who need help, who know it's not enough. Actually, I've had several experiences that are really, really, really depressing to me, you know. Uh, I've had this one guy come to the church. He had huge problems, marriage problems, divorce, his kids, everything. Financially, he came to church uh, every Sunday. He was here, you know, every week just soaking up the Word of God. And, and uh, you know, he, it seemed like he was growing and it seemed like Jesus became the Lord of his life, but then he quit coming after five, six months or so. And I, I bumped into him on the street here in Vienna a few months after that. And uh, I said, hey, hey, we've missed you. And you know what his revealing answer was? Well, I'm doing much better now. It's, it's good again. So what's this guy saying? Now that I'm doing better you know, not that I'm doing good, I, I, I'm sufficient in myself, I don't need God anymore. Man, I've heard that so many times in so many different versions, but it's always the same problem. It's self-righteousness, it's, you know, it's good, I'm good, I'm enough, you know, what do I need, anything or anybody or religion, you know, I am adequate in my own self. So we have achievement, uh, which is not a bad thing if we realize we don't have to achieve anything to be good with God. It's by faith in Christ alone. And, uh, but people believing that they are good enough. That's an a Austrian problem. I, I, I would say it's a European problem, probably an America problem. Uh, it's probably a problem in most of the civilized Western world where we're doing really well, or we're doing still well, you know, who knows how much longer um, uh, things are getting harder and tougher. But uh, it's a luxury problem, really, because when I look into the third world, Africa or other countries like that, I notice something totally different. People have different problems. You know, they want to survive. You know, a lot of them are very spiritual, sometimes wrong spirituality, uh, but they're also open for Jesus Christ. You know, they're, they're open for, for God because they know they're not sufficient. They know they're not adequate. They know they're not good enough. And so that's, in my opinion, a luxury problem that we have in a greater part or in a lot of the, the, the so-called first world or, or Western world, so to speak. Now, what is self-righteousness? What is it to be self-righteous? Well, let me give you three things. Uh, they all relate to each other, but uh, here they go. 
considering yourself to be good. Now, I don't think it's wrong if somebody else says you're a good guy, you're a good person. I think that's okay, you know. I'm glad when my wife tells me you're a good man, you're a good husband, you know. I'm proud of you. I think that's fantastic. But considering yourself to be good, that's self-righteous. And, man, look at Instagram, look at uh, all the social media. Everywhere you see it, how people make themselves good and present the best version of themselves. Actually, an unreal, a fake, a false version of themselves, you know. I've never seen a picture on Instagram uh, that was taken uh, two seconds after somebody woke up from, from their night's sleep, you know, all drowsy and sleepy and, and, and hung over. Never, you never see that on Instagram, no. After the shower, after brushing the teeth, after, you know, making sure your hair is fixed and the makeup and all that kind of stuff, only the best, only the highlight reel is presented. I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm saying it's not who we really are. And when we do that to portray a false image of who we are, I think that's a problem. Considering yourself to be good. The second thing is considering yourself to be good enough. Now, a lot of people, even, you know, in the Western world, if you go up to them and say, hey, uh, do you think you're a good person? What, what's the answer you would get from most people? Well, I suspect most people in America or Europe, you know, in the, in the modern Western world would say, well, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good gal. I'm okay. I'm okay, which leads me to my third uh, point, considering yourself to be better than, to be better than somebody else. Now, comparison is a big game, you know, and we actually start feeling good about ourselves when we compare ourselves to somebody who's not as good as we are. So, uh, if I say, well, I'm a, a pretty good person compared to uh, Joseph Stalin or to compared to Adolf Hitler, well, <laughs> congratulations, uh, yes. But, uh, uh, you know, but when we co compare ourselves, we always compare ourselves to the wrong person because God does not compare us to our neighbor, our brother, our sister, our aunt, our uncle, our mom, our dad. God always compares us to Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God who became man in human flesh. And the good news is, and that's, I'm getting ahead of myself here, is when we trust in Him, uh, we, we become like Him. We, we get um, you know, free from our sins. Our sins are washed away. Uh, he holds no sin against us. He makes us righteous in His own eyes. But Comparison is always a bad thing because unless you're an athlete and you want to get better or, you, or you, you, know, you just want to get better and better in your profession, it's good to, to see you know, how you can get better than your competition. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about comparing your own goodness, your own righteousness before a holy God with somebody else making yourself feel better and more holy and more righteous than somebody else. That is a sin, my friend. That is really, really bad news. And, and then if you find somebody who's better than you, you, you get depressed. You feel bad about yourself. So comparison uh, is a no-win situation. Uh, it either makes you feel better and haughty and, and uh, above somebody, or it makes you feel bad and under somebody. And both is not good. Neither is good. Now, let's continue in this story with that young man that fell in front of Jesus, called him good teacher, and what must I do to inherit an eternal life? And Jesus saying, no one is good except God alone. Verse 19, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. All these I've kept since when I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved, loved him. I love that. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He was so wrong. He was so messed up. But Jesus looked at him and loved him. 
Man, that's a good verse. One thing you lack, he said. Actually, it's only one thing. You know, he could have named all kinds of sins and all kinds of things. Obviously, in my life, in your life, there's so many different things that we are screwing up. But there's one thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. This is very interesting. I mean, can rich people really not be saved? Really not go to heaven? That's not what this passage is teaching. But a rich person cannot trust or depend on his riches to be saved. A rich person would have to, you know, detach himself or herself from his or her riches, go through that gate that, that's called the eye of the needle without anything, and then once it's proven that, that she or he is not trusting in riches, he can have it again. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being rich, but it's wrong to trust in riches. It's wrong to, to, to depend on your own sufficiency. And money to te tends to do that, just like good works tend to do that. So let's uh, look at three things here. Uh, number one, he was very rich. Now, is that a problem? No, not a problem. Absolutely not a problem. Uh, it's not a problem to be rich. I mentioned that. His riches had him. That's a big problem. In other words, he was possessed by his riches. He, he was had by his riches, so to speak. That's a big problem. Number three, he was very self-righteous. That's an even bigger problem. Now let's recap. He was rich, not a problem. His riches had him. He trusted in his riches. Big problem. He was very self-righteous, even bigger problem. Now, why do you think I'm telling you he was self-righteous? Well, it says it very clearly. One thing you lack, you know, and in the verse before he says, teacher, rabbi, good teacher, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Man, what a liar. I'm not saying he's a bad guy, not at all. He may have been a very upstanding citizen. He probably was. But to believe that you have kept every, every law and everything God says, that you actually say, I've kept all, all of these laws, well, that's self-righteous. The Bible teaches that we have all failed, that we have all sinned, that we have all fell short. In Romans 3, verse 10 through 12, it says, As it is written, the Apostle Paul quotes the Old Testament here, There is no one righteous... No one righteous, not even one. Only through God. There's no one righteous. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. And I love what verse 27 says. With man, it's impossible. It is impossible to be righteous with man, to go to a, with man, for man. It's impossible to be righteous with God. It's impossible to go to heaven for us human beings. We need a heavenly source. We need heavenly riches and we need heavenly righteousness. And only when we have that heavenly righteousness that is imputed unto us, that is given to us as a gift of grace and mercy, only then we have entrance into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So it is possible, 
Or it is possible for rich people to go to heaven. It's, rich, it's possible for poor people to go to heaven. It's, rich, it's possible for good people to go to heaven, for bad people to go to heaven. It's possible, but only when we realize my riches are nothing. My goodness is nothing. My own righteousness, Isaiah 64, verse 6, I believe, my own righteousness is nothing but dirty rags, filthy rags. So Jesus said that we did not keep any of the laws. Uh, Jesus says we've all lied, we've all broken, you know, marriage, uh, adultery, adultery, murder. We've all done that, Jesus said. You say, well, I've never cheated on my wife. I've never murdered anybody. Well, Jesus said, if we harbor hatred in our heart toward our brother, we are murderers. You know, if we lust uh, on another woman that we see, if we have lust, it's like we've already committed adultery in our hearts. So Jesus has a whole different standard because God has a whole different standard. If it's in your thoughts, in your heart, in God's eyes, you have sinned. You have done it, you know? That's the standard God has for us human beings. So it is a big problem if somebody believes that we have no sin that we have commit, uh, we, we have kept all the laws. Now let me get to the next very important point. There is no sin, absolutely no sin, that God hates more, detests more than self righteousness. We've just read in Romans chapter three, we're all unrighteous, guilty. All of us are guilty, sinners. All of us are sinners. There's not one person, no one who can stand before a perfect God. I don't care if your name is Mother Teresa or, or Pope Francis or Pope Benedict or whatever. Or I don't know who you are, but I know one thing. You are a sinner. You are a sinner. <laughs> I love you, man. You're, I love you. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. Self-righteousness is the sin that God detests absolutely the most. The deadliest mistake you can make on earth is believing that you're a good person. That actually will shut you out of heaven. No sin, you know? No sin. Now, some will say, well, the sin against the Holy Spirit, you know, and you will never have forgiveness. Jesus said, all sins will be forgiven, but the sin against the Spirit can never be forgiven, neither in this life or the next. Well, read the whole thing in context. A couple verses before Jesus, the whole story is about Pharisees coming to Jesus and saying, well, uh, you're casting out demons by the, the head of the demons because you are full of a demon. You are a demon, basically. They called him demon-possessed. Now, if you call Jesus demon-possessed, you cannot say he's the son of God. So that is the sin that's unforgivable, that shuts you out of heaven. Now, can somebody repent and turn to Jesus, you know, at any moment in time later, days, weeks, months, sometimes year, and fall on his knees and call Jesus Lord and Savior? Sure they can. I don't know if they will. I don't know how many who would, would commit that kind of a sin will. But if you change your mind about Jesus, if you denied him all your life, even called him, you know, a blasphemer, a false teacher, or whatever, even a good teacher for that matter, whatever you thought of him, if you come to the realization of who he is, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, he calls you blessed and saved, like, like he did to Peter. By the way, he called Peter Satan a few verses after he called him the rock. So it was not Peter personally, it was the belief, it was the the. The thing he said, but when we turn to Christ, all of our sins are forgiven. We when we turn to Christ from our own sufficiency, from our own riches, from our own goodness to him, we are saved no matter what we have done before. The deadliest mistake you can make on this earth is not murder. It's not stealing, lying, cheating, adultery, or anything else. The deadliest mistake you can make on earth 
is believing that you are a good person. I don't know how many people you know like that, but I know a bunch here in Austria. And the sad thing is I even know Christians who think they are something better. They think they're really good. You know, just right under Jesus, you know, right under Jesus, you know. On Sunday, somebody came to me and said, you know, uh, Pastor, you tell this story about, about uh, the high jumper who has, you know, the bar at, 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 uh, at two meters and 40 centimeters, which I think the world record is right around there. It doesn't matter if he can only jump one meter 80, one meter 40, or two meter and 39 centimeters, that bar will fall off because you're not jumping over. So it makes no difference whether you are 99% good or 3% good. Heaven is 100%. The Almighty is 100%. Jesus is 100%. You are not, I am not, and therefore our own goodness will not Give us entrance into the gates of heaven, paradise, the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, we will die in our sins because self-righteous people, they are actually not trusting God. They are trusting themselves. We have a bank here in Austria. Their slogan right now is believe in yourself. Well, you know, we have that in a lot of self-help literature. I know it's, it's good to believe in yourself in a certain way. I believe in myself, but only because I know who made me in his image. And I trust him for who he made me to be. But I have no faith in myself apart from God Almighty. So let's go to the next passage that's also very revealing. It's Luke 18. Uh, it says here uh, in verse 9 through 14, To some who were confident, confident, note that word, they were confident of their own righteousness, self-righteousness, and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. It's very clear who Jesus is talking to. Self-righteous, arrogant, haughty, uh, self-confident people. Two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, this man, rather than the other, went home to be Justified before God. Justified. Just if he had never sinned. Totally cleared of his sin. Freed. Forgiven. More than forgiven. Washed away. Made righteous. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. So he was made righteous. He was set free from his sin. Why does Jesus tell this story again? It was told to those people who were confident in themselves, their righteousness, their goodness, their own riches, so to speak, and they looked down at everybody else. Now, when you say, like I said already today, when you say to somebody in our Western world, do you think you're a good person? Most people say, yeah, I'm not, not that bad. And if you tell, ask them, you know, uh, even if they don't believe in anything or believe in something, I don't know. If you say, hey, if there was a heaven, just let's assume there is a heaven, would you go there if you died? Well, I probably would because for the most part, I was a pretty, pretty good person. Today, it's rare, it's literally rare to find somebody who is not self-righteous, really. You find a lot of people that even hate Christianity, for, for, for reasons that vary, but like for one reason like this. Uh, you know, I've been in, in, in prison, not for my own uh, <laughs> things I've done, though that would not be a problem for you, would it? Jesus has set me free from all sins, but I was in prison ministry. Actually, the f first time I was 19 and I went to a prison with my, my old friend from the United States, Cherry Pogue. He took me into this prison where there was murderers there, mainly murderers, people with a, a life sentence, 
they were in there for good for, for, till they, they would die there. And I was preaching there, and that was awesome. It was like the atmosphere, this one guy on his, on his piano playing Amazing Grace and singing Amazing Grace. And I asked my friend Jerry, who, who's gone to be with the Lord by now. He's, you know, 30 years older than me. Uh, he said, <laughs> he was my age then when he took me. So <laughs> uh, um, I said, who is this guy playing the piano Amazing Grace? He said, well, this is a guy. He, he's been in prison for 17 years. He will not get out either. He, he murdered his wife. Uh, under very, very, you know, horrible circumstances. And, uh, but you could not tell. He was free. He was more free than most people I know outside of prison. And, uh, you know, I've never been to the, to the death row. I mean, I'd like to go there sometime maybe, but maybe not. I mean, I don't know if that's my ministry right now, but you know, I loved preaching in prison to those murderers, and I loved seeing how they how they responded. And I preached 1 Timothy 1, where, where, where Paul talks about Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the worst, but he saved me as an example for all other sinners to follow. That's incredible. And well, some, a lot of people hate us, hate our faith. They don't understand our faith. Most people out there that do not believe in Christ, they believe Christianity is just like every other religion. It's about being a good person, becoming a better person, but stop right now. Jesus came not to make us better. He did not come to make bad people good or good people better. He came to make dead people alive. Wow, we were dead, but now we're alive. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any, any man or woman is in Christ, He's a new creature, a new living creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. He does not make us better. He makes us new. He does not just uh, refurbish us. He makes us brand new. He, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in us. We are brand new people. He came to make dead people alive. And, you know, they, they believe, you know, you guys... You, you think, you know, somebody's on death row, killed somebody, mass murderer, and on death row, they, they, they change their mind. They, they believe in Christ for the forgiveness of their horrible deeds, and they're okay. They go to heaven. But, you know, I've never killed anybody. I've never done any wrong. I'm such a good person. You know, I don't understand. Why, why, why would I not go to heaven? Well, that's the point. It has nothing to do with what you've done or do. It's about trusting Christ. We're all sinners, everyone, yeah? And if you look at somebody with a haughty look, you have already sinned. If you're envious, you've sinned. If you're proud, you're sinning. So you're a sinner. And the only ticket to heaven is Jesus for whoever, whatever they've done, the worst sinner or the best sinner if there's such a thing. <laughs> so whatever. So the Pharisee, actually started well. Pharisees started when the Greeks tried to, you know, come in and, 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 and bring their culture and mix it with the true faith in Yahweh and, and bring in their pagan deities. And, and the Pharisees said, stop, no. We will go letter by letter, um, the word of God, and we will, be, uh, we will just not accept anything except the Torah, you know, the Old Testament. And uh, we will just, uh, you know, fight for the, the law, and which was a good start. It's good to, 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 to be for the truth. But they became very extremes, and they made additional laws. And the problem is they became very full of themselves. And when you become full of yourself, there's not room for anything else. So either you're full of God or full of you. And when you're full of you, you know, you're empty of God. And the tax collector was the worst they, they were considered to be the biggest crooks. It was like a Ponzi scheme, like an MLM program. You know, he was like uh, put in charge by the Romans of a certain area to, to collect money, taxes. But he could take whatever he felt like. He could take more than he, he you know, he, he should and keep the rest for himself and even hire others to help him in the endeavor to raise, you know, raise the money. And it's crazy. And, and he came and, and, and one of the... The apostles, the 12, was also a tax collector, Matthew, Levi, and uh, he actually paid back. He said, I'm going to pay back the money. I'm going to pay a lot of it back. Whatever I can pay back, I'll pay it back. 
He repented. He came to Christ and he realized he's a sinner. That's the issue. Now in James 4, yesterday, last week we read a passage out of James 3. It talks about worldly and godly wisdom. And here in chapter 4, it's about, you know, people think they're righteous. In verse 6 it says, but he gives, he gives us more grace. Are you glad for the grace of God? I am. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. Come near to God. He'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Now, why is James saying that we should grieve, mourn, and wail? And Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, different circumstance. These guys, these people, they were believing they're good in themselves. And somebody who believes they're good in themselves, they need, to, they need to become miserable, you know? If you have somebody in your family that is showing God the cold shoulder and is really self-righteous and good, pray for that person lovingly. But don't pray, oh, make the, bless them, Lord. No, I don't pray that. Actually, I pray that they would become miserable. Miserable for their own good to, to come to their knees and to, to realize they're haughty and proud. Make them humble, Lord. Uh, you know, and, and let them become, I pray like this, make, them, make him or her miserable until they realize who you are and save them, God. We can only be saved when we realize our condition. Yes, some people, some Christians that are constantly guilty, uh, guilt-laden with no reason because they've been forgiven, constantly the devil tells them you're nothing, you're worthless. They need to quit that and they need to be told, rejoice, you're free, you're holy in God's eyes. Absolutely. But self-righteous people, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. It's not a contradiction at all. It's a two different conditions. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment. So we should not judge people. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy by you. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow, we will go do this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Why? Do you not even know? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist. Don't you know that you're nothing? That appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. All such self-righteousness and self-sufficiency and self-image you know, image and believing is wrong. It's evil. Should we have a good image of ourselves? Yes, God's image. We're image bearers of God. In your own righteousness, you are lost. In His righteousness, you are saved. You're redeemed. You're free. And that leads us to our last passage. It's a highlight in the Bible. Maybe one of the most important passages in Scripture. Romans 3. But now. But now. Wow. No matter what was. But now. If you believe. But now. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given not earned, given, through faith, not works, in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Man, it can't be any clearer than this. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile or any other group of people. For all have sinned, that includes you and me, and the holiest people you know, and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness, not, oh, 
because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now that's awesome. That is awesome. God is love, but he's not soft. He tells us the truth, our condition, but his love is unlimited. Jesus wasn't nice. Jesus was true and loving. It's his story, not my story. It's his way, not my way. It's his righteousness, not my own righteousness. It's his holiness, not my own. But if I trust in him, it's no longer what I've done. It's what he has done. And he has finished the work on the cross. What he did made me right before God. What he did makes you right before God if you believe. All self-righteousness is evil. It will shut you out of heaven's kingdom. But trusting in Him, knowing who you really are and your condition, and trusting Him for salvation makes you righteous, holy, and gives you the only goodness, the only right standing that can stand before a holy, righteous, and only good God. In Jesus' name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these listeners, for these earnest seekers. Thank you, God, that your word is true and that you are love and you are truth. And I pray, God, for everyone listening to this message that you would do a work in their heart as you've done in mine and in many others who have realized I am nothing, you are everything. I can do nothing only through you, through you can I. What's impossible with man is only possible with God. If you need to receive Jesus and be free from self-righteousness and all other sins, turn from your sins. If you feel bad because you feel so sinful, man, you're in good company. Turn away from your sins. Turn to Jesus. He forgives you in a minute. No, 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 no. In a second. No, no, no. In a millisecond, no, 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 even faster. In the blinking of an eye, you're changed. Pray this, Jesus, I trust you. You died for all of my sins. Forgive me now. Make me new. Wash my sins away. Be my Savior. You are my God, my Lord. You died, you rose again, and you live forevermore. I give you my life. I receive yours in Jesus' name. Amen. My friend, you are a child of God. If you prayed this prayer, uh, if you confess Christ as your Lord and trust Him totally, you are a child of God. Now, if you're a self-righteous believer, quit it. (laughs) Quit. Just stop. Stop. Please stop. You're not good in your own ways. There's only one good God. Just fall on your knees. Let's stop self-righteous religion, even in the body of Christ, and realize we are all brothers and sisters. You know, that's the reason I don't like being called reverend or thing. I don't like that at all. Only one is the true reverend. The one to be revered holy is only one God. I'm your brother, Carl Michael. And... I'm in the same boat with you. A sinner. I'm no longer a sinner. I'm now a sinner saved by grace. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I still sin, but I'm made righteous. I love you, and I'll see you next week.